Hello and welcome to the U.S. History Underground. I'm Mr. O'Hagan and I'm here with Mr. Zagari. Hey folks, how we doing? Today on the Underground, Roosevelt to Roosevelt, from Teddy to Franklin, and everything in between. TR and FDR are iconic presidents. They're distant cousins, fifth cousins actually, mm -hmm. but they are linked by much more than a surname. Both Teddy and Franklin usher in a new era in federal government policy and a new philosophy on the role of the federal government in the lives of the American people. Now, neither Teddy nor Franklin is the sole originator of these ideas, but they are the most obvious champions of these new policies and new approaches. We think of Teddy's presidency as the start of the 20th century. After all, he took office in 1901 mm -hmm. after McKinley was assassinated. Zags, could you provide us some context for where we are in 1900? Sure. So let's look domestically on this. Let's flash back to 1865. In post-Civil War America, we see the United States begin to realize the Hamiltonian vision of an industrialized United States with the rise of big business. Industrialists like Carnegie and Rockefeller have transformed American business practices and have literally built America from the ground up. What is absent from the Hamiltonian vision is an energetic, hands-on federal government. Hamilton explained these points as early as Federalist No. 1 when he said, the vigor of government is essential to the security of liberty. During the era of the Gilded Age, we are closest to the true free market capitalism the U.S. has ever been. Growth, but no regulation. As a result, there is a significant exploitation of workers and consumers. The rich got richer and the poor became poorer. The gap between rich and poor grew at a tremendous rate. Remember, this is the Gilded Age, but the streets are not paved in gold for everyone. So that's halfway to the Hamiltonian vision. Exactly. Okay, so that's the domestic side of things in the years leading up to 1900. Where are we in terms of foreign policy, Zags? Well, what we see here is that George Washington is still alive and well in the 1860s and 70s, or at least his policies are. We are still holding on to the ideas of neutrality and no permanent alliances. But that economic growth we just mentioned is giving us a new foundation, newfound confidence, and a need to expand our footprint. As we get further into the 1880s and 1890s, we want to expand our trade. We see the benefit of new markets to sell our goods. We embrace the potential of colonies that will provide us with new raw materials. So that takes us to 1900 and our new foreign policy. So now we have our context, Mr. O. Let's talk about what domestic and foreign policy looks like while Teddy and his fellow progressives are in office from 1900 to 1920. Well, domestically, Teddy wants political solutions to the flaws of the Gilded Age. Others have called for solutions, populists, mm -hmm. muckrakers, but he's the figure who will act, along with like-minded members of Congress, to make these reforms a reality at the national level. Remember his square deal, regulation, trust busting, conservation, they all indicate a desire for the government to be involved. And don't forget, Teddy's the federal level. We see these developments taking place at the private level with like Jane Adams, Jane in, Adams House, in the whole house, right? Absolutely. Uh, Robert La Follette in Wisconsin. Yep. But Teddy, again, is the federal symbol of that. So, Zags, what's the shift in foreign policy that T.R., Taft, and Wilson represent? Well, T.R. oversees an America that wants more from the world and is willing to get more involved in foreign affairs. This is more than a slow walk away from the neutrality of the past. It's a jog. The Spanish-American War, the Panama Canal, Roosevelt Corollary, they all demonstrate a shift in policy and sensibility of America's role, at least in the Western Hemisphere. Our involvement in World War I under Wilson is a natural progression from Western Hemisphere policemen to active participant in world affairs. And that domestic economic growth that we talked about, that feeds into this change in foreign policy too, doesn't it? Oh, absolutely. Our economic ties mean that we can't ignore German U-boats firing on merchant vessels. Historian Howard Zinn famously said, you can't be neutral on a moving train. I changed that a bit to, you can't be neutral dodging German torpedoes. No, that's a heavy lift to, For to get, get across the Atlantic and, yeah. and not, be, uh, not be impacted by torpedoes. Absolutely. But still, 
this is progressive spirit. This progressive spirit doesn't last. So let's chat about this return to normalcy, Mr. O'Hagan. How does that apply to the 1920s? And what does it mean for our foreign and domestic policy in that matter? Well, the 20s really is a walk back, isn't it, Zags? I mean, you've got Harding, Coolidge, Hoover, and they all embrace a pre-progressive, laissez-faire, associative state model. They're, they're looking for a return to the old days, which to them is the Gilded Age, the normal days before the federal government was the big regulator. You know, that sounds very similar to the viewpoint held by those same leaders on foreign policy. Yes, yeah, it does. Right? We say no to the Treaty of Versailles, and the 1920s then is still all about keeping us away from that European drama. When Coolidge says the business of America is business, you can envision that as not only being pro-industry, but also a kind of America first sensibility towards foreign involvement. Like we just really want to stay away from any type of European drama that could be going on on that side of the Atlantic. Normalcy is a rollback in domestic policy, but it's also a rollback in foreign policy. Absolutely. Okay. So 1880 to 1900, no government intervention, neutrality in foreign policy. 1900 to 1920, the progressives, government regulation and Mm -hmm. expanding foreign involvement. 1920s, no government intervention, neutrality in foreign policy, right? Now, I mean, that's that's the historical pendulum, if ever there was one. Are we in the 30s now, Zags? Yes. And FDR is the return to the, the progressives' world and domestic view. If the 20s is the walk back, FDR is a push forward and never looking back. Sp- and spoiler, FDR's New Deal is going to cut the strings on that pendulum. He wants to make the walk back an impossibility, doesn't he, Zags? Oh, 100%. FDR's domestic policy is driven clearly by the Great Depression. Here's the headline. Economic tension calls for government intervention. And I got to give a shout out to the guys in uh, period six, uh, to DJ, Michael, Gavin, uh, John Luigi, and and Stephen for that headline from our lesson the other day. That's a top flight headline. You know, Absolutely. But FDR puts forth an unprecedented amount of legislation to try to mitigate the economic hardships of the American people. I mean, let's see it. The three R's, the relief, recovery, and reform, all bring unprecedented power to the federal government. Mr. O'Hagan, how, why do you think FDR was able to wield this unprecedented federal authority? I mean, this is a huge shift. It is. And I, I think the answer is need, right? I mean, desperation. Yeah, it's got to be. It's an, un, to use your term, it's an unprecedented crisis. So the American people saw a need for a more progressive era style approach to solve the problems they faced. And the New Deal is the progressive era on steroids, right? Full on, full throated <laughs> government involvement. FDR has full support at home for big government intervention. But that full throated support for more government didn't necessarily translate to a full-throated Wilsonian, Uh, America is all in foreign policy in 1932 or 33, did it, Zags? No, absolutely not. Clearly, the focus is going to be on the home front. Even with the march of aggression in Europe and Asia, the U.S. still insisted on staying neutral. Heck, that old, we got enough of our own problems, we don't need anybody else's attitude was hard to argue against in the depths of the Great Depression. But FDR saw the writing on the wall. He was a global thinker again, like we mentioned before. He's a global thinker like Wilson. And does that makes complete sense because even though Teddy Roosevelt and Wilson hated each other's guts, mm-hmm. Franklin Roosevelt was actually the undersecretary of war in the Wilson administration or in their secretary of Navy. Navy. Undersecretary of Navy in, yep. the, in the Wilson administration. And FDR could see that Europe was on the path to yet another world war. I mean, that the Treaty of Versailles sealed that deal. But nonetheless, while Hitler or Mussolini expanded in Europe, the United States stuck with a policy of neutrality. By 1937, he saw this as an epidemic of world lawlessness and called for a quarantine against these belligerent nations. His quarantine speech was well received in some circles, and FDR, for political purposes, had to slow down his globalist rhetoric, excuse me, was not well received in some circles. When war broke out in 1939, when the German invasion of Poland, the U.S. still held on to its policy of neutrality. It wasn't until the bombing of Pearl Harbor on December 7th, 1941, that the U.S. declared war on Japan, and not till the 11th, when Germany declared war on the United States, was America fully committed to the Second World War. If the New Deal was the progressive era on steroids, then the U.S. entering into the Second World War is American foreign policy on steroids. The United States entered the war on the side of the Allies, bringing not only its industry, 
but also FDR's leadership. The U.S. adopted a policy of total war, committing significant resources to defeat the Axis powers. The U.S. was also a key wartime policymaker at conferences with the Allied powers in Casablanca, Tehran, and Yalta, which was FDR's last. These conferences once again show a tremendous shift in our foreign policy. During World War I, we sent our military, but our political leadership fell onto deaf ears. However, during World War II, our military, industry, and political leadership has propelled the United States into one of the key policymakers of the entire war. Domestically, as part of this shift, when the U.S. mobilized the home front, the federal government was leading the charge with controlling wartime production, instituting rationing, amongst many others. FDR signed the first War Powers Act on December 18th, uh, 1941, just a little over a week after the bombings of Pearl Harbor, and the Second War Powers Act in 1942. But perhaps the biggest example of growth of federal power, or at least for the President of the United States, is him running for a fourth term. But again, yeah, we could go on and on about his foreign and domestic policy expansion during the Second World but, War. But we don't have time for that. Yeah, but that's the takeaway. You know, clearly, there's an enormous growth in federal enormous, power. Enormous. But what about after the war, Mr. O'Hagan? How do we see this as a continuation of this revolutionary time as we see after World War II. Okay, so, so this is a little bit of reasoning, right, that College Board would ask us to think about, which is looking past the time period. In 1945, we'll have a post-war government that still abides by these regulations and a culture that embraces an active role for the government. Sure, there will continue to be political conservatives who call for another 20, 20s like return to normalcy, but they are looked upon as being backwards, 19th century men. In foreign policy, neutrality also sounded like a cry from a forgotten era. We were the USA, the country that defeated the Nazis, that ended the Japanese empire, that saved Europe. You know, the rest of the world can't do it without us. We're an indispensable nation. That's how we see ourselves. Who we are in 1945 is a far cry from a country of unregulated isolationists. And Teddy starts us on this activist path. It's just that Franklin finishes it. Absolutely. Well, that's all for today, folks. We hope you see the connections between these time periods. College Board loves to compare and contrast larger time periods on the DBQs. So this is a great example of how you uh, could do that for period seven, 1898 through 1945. Be sure to use this YouTube channel for its content spotlights, unit reviews, a push on the road segments, and other spectacular podcasts. We'll see you next time on the U.S. History Underground. Peace out.